Last night at the same time, we brought you new reporting on Chris Watts, the man convicted of killing his pregnant wife and two young daughters. Tonight, we have a new scoop. In August of 2018, Chris Watts killed his pregnant wife, Shanann, in their northern Colorado home. Investigators say he did it because she found out about an affair he was having. He then put his wife's body in his truck along with his two little girls. He drove them all to a work site. He buried Shanann's body, and then one by one, he smothered his two little girls, four-year-old Bella and three-year-old Celeste, then stuffing their bodies into an oil tank. A new documentary about the case called The Family Next Door, an American Murder, is currently the number one video on Netflix. Last night, we reported about how much the intimate details in it are upsetting Chris Watts. Well, tonight, there's word of new fallout for Watts from this documentary. Court TV special correspondent Ashley Banfield has been more, doing more digging on this. So, Ashley, what is the scoop tonight? Well, if Chris Watts is having trouble stomaching the idea that we are now uh, getting more information about his text messaging and his cheating and his wedding and all the things that make him the monster that he is, apparently this is upsetting him. This was a great scoop by People Magazine's Steve Helling. Turns out Steve has even more today. Reporting exclusively for People Magazine, Steve Helling now confirms that that man on your screen right there is consoling himself with love letters in prison where he is serving his life no parole sentence in Wisconsin. So exactly the name of the facility, Dodge Correctional Facility, it's in Wapen, Wisconsin. Apparently, um, after he moved there, a uh, deluge of letters came in, not all of them kind, certainly lots of people very disgusted, appropriately so, about his behavior, about his actions, about his murders, familial annihilation. But some of those letters were people who thought he was handsome and thought they might be able to strike up a romance with him. And because he has nothing else to do, stuck in a cell 23 hours a day by himself under protective custody, out only once to shower and eat, uh, he decided to engage in some of this pen pal ship and has continued his letter love affair with some of these women. Don't ask. I'm at a loss too. I feel exactly what you're feeling right now. Hard to even spit out the words, in fact. So some of the women, according to Steve Helling's reporting, and his sources are good, some of the women have expressed compassion. Let me just breathe and do some meditation for a moment. Compassion with this man. And let's just all remind ourselves who they're showing compassion for. The man who murdered his pregnant wife and then snuffed the life of those two little girls out one by one and jammed their bodies into oil tanks at the site where he worked in Colorado. And in case there's any mystery to this and that maybe the women don't believe he did it, he told us he did it. And here is the tape to prove it when he confessed it all to the Georgia Bureau of Investigations roll tape. Put the blanket over here. I didn't want to. No. I sprinkled her right there in the back seat. Okay. What was Fallon doing? She's in the desire. Did she understand that she knows what well. She didn't say anything. And then the same for Bell. Just without the blanket. With the blanket. Oh, okay. I didn't look. I think every time I closed my eyes, I said to see her say, Daddy, no, and that was it. So, yeah, I misspoke. I said the Georgia Bureau, that's Colorado uh, Bureau of Investigation. I think I can't contain myself because I knew it was coming. And I think a lot of people who cover this story um, and who follow the story knew a lot of these details. So, it is still just unfathomable that there are those who reach out to Chris Watts with compassion and love and romance on their minds. Steve Helling um, was kind enough to sit uh, down for another interview tonight about this next remarkable scoop that he just got two days in a row. And we talked about not only this one, but all of the other ones that we have covered just like this over the years. Have a look. 
Steve, I don't know whether to say you've done it again or whether to say, how on earth is this possible? Yeah, you know, the crazy thing is, I was just checking in on whether Chris Watts, how he was reacting to this new you know, documentary that's out there. And I started learning that he was getting mail. And he's getting a lot of mail from people who are familiar with this case. They're interested in him. And yes, some of it is people telling him that they hope he burns in hell. Some of it is people who are trying to save his soul. But there's a lot of women who are reaching out to him because they think he's handsome or interesting or a potential partner for them. And you know what? He's writing them back. He has nothing better to do. So he is maintaining correspondence with women while he's in jail. You have to wonder if any of those women who are reaching out to him have actually taken the time to do some, you know, online research perhaps and watch the tapes where he himself describes to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation what he did to his children and his pregnant wife. You've got to wonder if they know all the details. Yes, you do have to wonder that, but this isn't the first time that you and I have seen this happen. This isn't the first criminal who did something awful that has women who are interested in them. Scott Peterson, who killed his pregnant wife. There were lots of women who were interested in him. Drew Peterson, we'll go for the Drew Peterson too. There were rumors he was getting letters. Yes, I mean, these people get a lot of letters. There are a lot of women who find, I don't know if they're interested in the bad boy. I don't understand it. I don't understand the reasoning behind it. But there are lots of women who are interested in men who are in prison. You were just about to go to Menendez. And it's not just love letters. That one went like just off the rails. That went to, went to marriage. And I don't understand how you can have a marriage with somebody who is spending life in prison without the possibility of parole. What does that type of marriage look like? But yes, Lyle got married while behind bars. Twice. And twice, twice, two times. So it's not just one, but it was two women who were interested in him. You know, and, and you say to yourself, why? What do these guys have that makes people interested in them? And I think there's something to do with the notoriety. I think there's something to do with um, these women who feel like they know them in some way. And so, for whatever reason, they fall in love. And we should throw the Eric factor in there, too. He, he got married once as well. Usually, you hear about divorce when someone's locked up for life because the wife says, well, you know, what's the point of this? I'm out. You don't usually hear you're divorcing the woman who met you in, in prison and the marriage has gone south because the, the prisoner cheated. And that was the story with Eric. I'm curious if you think, just extrapolating a little further, on the mindset of the, of the women who do this. Mm -hmm. Do you think they think that somehow they can redeem this person or change this person? I think that is an issue. I think a lot of times they think, oh, if he'd only known me, he wouldn't have done what he did, or I still see the humanity in him, I still see something good in this person, and maybe I can help them turn it all around. I think there is some of that that happens, and that's really interesting when you think about it, because you know, I don't know how you can help somebody if you're not living with them, if you're not staying with them and spending, you know, a great deal of time with them. Just a few letters, or in Chris Watts' case, some of them are writing him letters every day. You know, even that isn't enough to turn somebody's life around. You have to be there and be present. And you can't be present when you're married, when you're married to somebody in jail. And, and really, what's the end game? So let's just say for, for grins here, you turn their life around. Where's that going to get you? I mean, you turn their life around, but they're still in prison. Right. And in the case of Chris Watts, he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life. Nothing is going to change that. There's no way out of him being in prison. So I don't know why you would fall in love and decide to give your life to somebody who's behind bars. I don't understand it. Yeah. And I, listen, some prisons allow conjugal visits, some don't. And I don't know what his circumstances are or whether any of the women know uh, whether there's a shot at seeing him physically, but the whole good looking thing, you know, sometimes that's not even it. Charles Manson, not the most handsome fella in the world, was rumored to have been engaged to a 26 year old girl. I think her name was Star at some point. He eventually called that idea, and I think these are his words, trash. But Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, not handsome guys, and yet they drew lovers. And, and in the case of Richard Ramirez, he did marry. Right. You know, well, that's a great example. I've learned over my years on this earth that everybody has a type. 
And there are probably people who thought that Charles Manson was handsome or that Richard Ramirez was handsome. I don't know. Um, you know, I would say that when we're talking about a Scott Peterson or Chris Watts, yeah, they're more classically handsome guys. And that might have something to do with it. They may get more letters from more women. But, you know, reality wise, I think there are people who just fall for the people they see on television. And we've seen that happen time and time again. So there's the other factor of sort of the brutality of someone. If you think about Chris Watts, um, and if you haven't done your research and you're writing love letters, shame on you on so many levels, but the brutality of what he was capable of, not only murdering his pregnant wife, but then smothering those two girls and then brutalizing their bodies. And I'm going to be graphic here because this is Chris Watts. He shoved those little girls' bodies into an eight inch diameter, maybe nine inch diameter pipe, not big enough to um, be able to smoothly go through those oil tank openings. So when they recovered those girls' bodies, their bodies were brutalized by the, by the shoving. That is Chris Watts. Right. That is the man. Looks aside. And yet, we see with Ted Bundy as well. He yeah. also married in prison. So these women don't even care what these men are capable of or have done. It's not just a crime they were rumored to have done or a jury convicted them of. It's known they did it. It's, it's kind of confounding to say the least. Confounding is the right word for it. And I think, you know, there's some level of denial there. I think there's some level of explaining it away. Well, you know, he was under great duress or there was something wrong with him at the time that he did it, but he's different now and you should read the letters that he writes me. You know, that's, when I've spoken to people who've fallen in love with somebody in prison, they usually say, oh, he's changed or she's different or something is different or something is new. You know, and I think that's what you're seeing here. These are people who believe that Chris Watts is redeemable and also that he's already been redeemed. Well, once again, they should watch the documentary we discussed, you know, just last night. And that shows the text messages that Chris Watts was capable of writing to his dear pregnant wife, mother of his two other daughters. Uh, Nothing's wrong. Love you. Can't wait to see you. And within right. hours, he would murder her. Right, exactly. Maybe we have the luxury of having read through thousands of pages of discovery. And you and I have, you know, watched these court proceedings for so long that we know what these people have done. I can only assume that some of the people who write letters to Chris Watts haven't really looked at all the you know, case documents because if they did, I can't imagine that they'd be professing their love for him. And if they did and they, they did profess their love for him, I think they're deeply, deeply troubled people themselves. Steve Helling, congratulations on another great scoop. You're just so good at your job and thank you for being on with us. Thank you. And Vinny, it just makes you wonder, you know, if, um, if, <laughs> If there were a, a, an account, like a Tinder account with, you know, the details of this uh, person's, you know, appearance and then the fact that they had just casually murdered their children and their pregnant wife, you know, would these women respond to that? My thought is no. So why on earth do they reach out when these men are jailed? You know, you wouldn't go near somebody someone told you did those things. But if they're jailed, all of a sudden something is different. I should tell you this, though. Um, he does get hate letters. Steve Helling said that the letters are oftentimes hate letters. Uh, he gets letters from people who are very angry about what happened. He also gets letters from people who say they are praying for him, Vinny. That I'm not so surprised at. But I will also tell you that uh, Steve has found out that the mail deliveries to this correctional facility have surged since the Netflix documentary. I could, I could absolutely see that. And just on a quick side note, just to change things a little bit, you know, Steve Helling talking about classically handsome. Don't you think Steve Helling with that beard, classically handsome? Steve, he's the man. Yeah. <laughs> Other than you, Vinny, Vinny Blue Eyes, uh, yeah, Steve Helling is a very handsome man. All right. <laughs> Ashley Banfield, thank you so much. Appreciate it. You bet.